So good evening, everybody. I am Holly Benton. I'm the executive director for the Orthodox Christian Leadership Initiative. So thrilled to be seeing all of you tonight. Um, we've had a number of people register, so they will probably slip in as we continue along. I've asked uh, Father Paul Hodge to open us with prayer. He is the administrator of our Orthodox Coaching Network. So I've asked him to begin us with a word of prayer tonight. So before I begin, I want to um, set, it's unusual, I'm going to set up the prayer. That's odd. Um, but it, the, bear with me. So I have an app that sends me a verse every day on my watch or on my phone. It's called the um, the Holy Bible by the company that's called Version. Some of you might be familiar with it. And today's verse was from uh, the sixth chapter of St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, verse 2. So I looked it up and I saw verse 3 and I thought, you know, this is just right for us. So let me read the verse and then we'll begin with the prayer. Carry one another's burdens, says the apostle, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. And here's the next verse. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ our God, look down upon this gathering and pour out upon us your Holy Spirit, that by hearing the instruction given to us, we may increase to your goodness, to the upbuilding of your holy church, to the comfort of our friends, family, and benefactors. For to you are due all glory, honor, and worship to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And I'll explain a little more of my thinking around that verse when I talk about the coaching network in a moment. Okay, thank you, Father. Um, so I would just like to say a little bit about this series, the Coaching and Leadership Series is a free online quarterly series offered by the Orthodox Coaching Network through the Orthodox Christian Leadership Initiative, and it's designed to help develop coaching practices you can use in your own leadership responsibilities. So some of our participants tonight are professional certified coaches, others are currently in training, and some are thinking about becoming trained as coaches, and others are just simply interested in familiarizing themselves with some of the coaching practices. A year ago, we introduced the Orthodox Coaching Network and provided an introduction to coaching within an Orthodox Christian context, and then last June, we had our first um, quarterly series. Father Paul Lundberg started that series with a session on perspective. And you can find both of those recorded events on our YouTube channel or by visiting our website. Uh, Father Paul Hodge is the administrator for a group, a, a growing group of professional coaches. Tonight's session is really aimed at normalizing coaching practices. I was talking with Father Elias Dorham earlier this evening and I said, you know, I think coaching will probably go through a process much like um, professional psychologists went through where the church was a little nervous about them. What do counselors and psychologists and psychiatrists have to do with the work that we're doing in the church? You know, decades ago, three or four decades ago, I think they were met with some suspicion. Um, but now they, they're, it's a normalized practice and you know, many priests refer to clinically trained psych psychologists to help their flock and those in need who may be in need of some professional services. And likewise, I think coaching, because it's a newer industry, um, I think it's met with some suspicion at times. But um, I, I think this type of session is meant to help people familiarize themselves with what the practice is really about and understand you know, that it's not replacing the spiritual father in any form or fashion. Um, and I've asked Father Paul Hodge just to say a few brief words about um, the Orthodox Coaching Network and why it exists. And, you know, if you're interested in coaching, how you can get involved. Father Paul? Sure. So getting back to that verse I shared um about carrying one another's burdens, uh, that's part of the motive for the coaching network. What it is, what the coaching network is, is a, a group of um, people who are either professional coaches certified or um, who are, whose certification is pending, who have received training, or those who are 
uh, seeking to be certified and are in the process of training as coaches um, and working with clients as coaches to meet monthly for uh, mutual assistance, support, um, to share uh, learning around skills, to gain uh, new opportunities for coaching, to have access to um, to experts in the field and occasionally hear a, you know, a special guest or speaker and to um, share resources together. So we, as Holly said, we are growing. Um, and uh, so if anyone on the call is a coach, a professional coach or someone who's in training to be a coach I and you're not already part of the Orthodox Coaching Network, I encourage you to go to orthodoxservantleaders.com and check it out. Did I get everything, Holly, or was there anything else that you wanted uh, you wanted folks to hear about the coaching network? No, I, I think that was great. I mean, I think, you know, just like um, sometimes it's just nice to find people who have who are like minded, you know. So if you're looking for a financial counselor or a lawyer or a psychologist or even an architect, it's really nice to find people who are professing Orthodox Christians who are you know work in those professional areas because sometimes just having that common worldview that common um that common place in the body of christ can can just you know there's a lot more trust there and um you can kind of have a common jumping off point so really the the orthodox coaching network is meant to provide coaches an opportunity to offer their coaching services to clergy and orthodox christian leaders as a mutually enriching exchange and blessing within the body of christ and to connect orthodox professional coaches with the network of like-minded coaches so all of those things father um really play into why we have the coaching network and and how people in the church in their different roles and responsibilities and kind of working on their own careers could really benefit from a, an orthodox professional coach. At this time, I'd really like to invite and introduce Father Elias Dorham. He serves as the associate pastor at Holy Transfiguration Church in McLean, Virginia. He and his wife, Cordia Silvia, have been married for 29 years. They have 10 children and three grandchildren. He's a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, and his experiences encompass a variety of leadership roles, including service as an active duty naval officer. He's had several leadership tours in the federal government and various leadership roles in private industry. He holds a BS in political science from the U.S. Naval Academy and a MS in information systems technology from the Naval Postgraduate School. He also holds an MA in Theological Studies from the Christendom College Graduate School, and he is also a D-Men candidate at St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary. He's an International Coach Federation Associate Certified Coach, and he maintains a professional coaching practice. So with that, welcome, Father Alliance. We are so excited to have you lead this session tonight. Thanks so much. That was really a mouthful, and I am sorry. <laughs> All right. Um, just a little bit of a roadmap uh, about where we're going tonight. Um, we're gonna. I'm going to talk for a few minutes about uh, assertions and assessments, and I'll explain what that means. We're actually going to do some, as a friend of mine likes to say, kinetic learning. So we'll turn off our cameras uh, after I get a volunteer, and we'll do uh, a live coaching demo here uh, as part of this uh, activity tonight for about 30 minutes. We'll turn the cameras back on, talk a little bit more about assertions and assessments. We'll do a group activity uh, with recording off <laughs> once more, and then we will wrap up. Um, just you know, a, a quick comment, just to sort of set the atmosphere for our call this evening. Um, when we talk about coaching, we we really do talk about things that are that are fairly intimate to people, right? And so I would just like to declare a container or a safe space here during this call. So I would ask that the things that people share on the call, and certainly the things that we talk about during the uh, portions that are not recorded, I ask that those stay here uh, and on the call and, uh, and not be shared just out of respect uh, for everyone's privacy. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen if I can make the computer work. Uh, okay, that looks like it might be working. Okay, can everyone see my slides? Okay, perfect. So here we go. 
So let's let's start with just a really quick question to set the stage, right? So Holly talked about you know the beginning of uh, counseling, how you know there was perhaps some suspicion within Orthodox Christian and other Christian confession circles, you know, mentoring, consulting, right? Sometimes they, these can all be confused. I would characterize coaching as another type of helping conversation. One way to think about it, you know, in counseling, you can think about uh, counselors working with patients, and the therapy process is really driven by the counselor. Um, not the patient, and it's about the therapist's judgment and educational background to address soul care. With mentoring, the mentors develop and cultivate others by relying on their own life experience uh, and background as an example. And with consulting, uh, a consultant advises their clients and they work with them on how to get from point A to point B by giving expert advice. But coaching is different. And some of you may recognize this quote. It's from the um, Orthodox Christian Leadership Initiative webpage, and I'm not going to read this to you. I just want to highlight part of it. Uh, one, the individual coach is serving the client with the belief that that client likely already has many of the answers needed within themselves. So whereas a consultant focuses on the what, okay, problem solving, giving advice, the coach really focuses on the who, the person being coached. And the focus of coaching is around gaining awareness and taking next steps. So that's an important distinction. And we're going to talk tonight about why that matters in terms of assessments and assertions. Now, why coaching? So a quote that I shared with Holly for this presentation tonight, you know, coaching is the process of engaging in direct, insightful and supportive conversation. Why? For the purpose of gaining, gaining clarity and growing in self-knowledge in order to become more purposeful, intentional, and fulfilled in all the dimensions of life, personal, professional, communal. So possible outcomes of being coached, right? a better understanding of your own impact on others and the results you're trying to obtain, better relationships with others, personally, professionally, within the parish, and more effective collaboration with other people, right? You're able to perhaps get some of the things done more effectively that you're trying to do. So in an Orthodox Christian context, our own personal goals and concerns should always be aligned in reference to Christ and growing in Christ's likeness. So there are three words typically associated with our spiritual tradition, which I think we can apply to, to coaching in some sense. Uh, one of those is nepsis or watchfulness. Right? especially as regards our thoughts, because assertions and assessments are about certain types of thoughts, and we'll get into that. Uh, diacrisis, or uh, discrimination or discernment, uh, helping to distinguish between different thoughts and impulses. Our thoughts, which we're going to talk about tonight, lead to certain actions and behaviors. So there's a relationship there. And then eschesis, right? The word comes from the idea of self-discipline or self-denial and being watchful of our thoughts. Uh, and controlling the inner dialogue, uh, it's, it can be an ascetical effort. It can really take um, a lot of, uh, it, it's difficult to do. That's the word I'm looking for, sorry. So assessments and assertions. We often have heard it said that words have power. And so assessments and assertions give us a new way of thinking about uh, language and the impact of language. Now, we typically think about language as something which describes and communicates. From a coaching perspective, we can also say that language creates and it generates in a qualified sense. And for a leader, whether you're a leader in your parish, a leader in a corporate environment, whether you are a leader in your home as a parent, language also influences relationships and, and the culture of the organization in which you're operating. So at the interpersonal level, we can frame our conversations in terms uh, we can frame our relationships, I'm sorry, in terms of conversations. And if you think about this, if we change the types of conversations we're having, we can change the types of relationships or the quality of the relationships. Just, you know, you think of an example, if you decide to stop speaking to someone in your own home and stop having conversations, um, the relationship will probably have a turn not for the better very soon thereafter. Uh, another example, something I like to call missing relationships or missing conversations, sorry. Um, oftentimes, if maybe uh, relationships in a corporate environment are not as smooth as they should be, things aren't quite right, 
uh, it's because there are conversations that need to be had that aren't being had. And so we can look at conversations and the impact they have on all dimensions of our relationships. Uh, in terms of culture at the organizational level, whether that organization is a parish or a home or a place of business, again, um, language and how words are used and conversations specifically, um, they it's a two-way street, certain causality, right? So certain conversations that are allowed lead to a certain type of culture, perhaps a culture of transparency, a culture of mutual accountability, or, you know, we've probably all been in environments where perhaps there's a culture of mutual blame or a culture of recrimination, and all this is manifested through the types of conversations. So that's just a little bit about the idea that words do have power and why we need to think about language. Now, how does this impact on coaching? Listening and hearing are not the same thing. Oftentimes we think of listening and hearing together, but you know, the Lord often says in the scriptures, let he who has ears, let him hear. So we can think as listening, of listening as something is, is strictly biological, right? It's a bone vibrating in an eardrum, there's physics, there's biology, there's sound waves, right? But we can talk at least tonight for our context of hearing as something that's more linguistic, right? And it requires active interpretation or internal storytelling. So we build a story, we build a narrative, and then we build an interpretation about what is said and heard, right? So what we listen to, we, we put it within a framework in which we exist mainly through, through language. Our interpretations have more to do with us than with the words necessarily spoken to us by others. And so there's something called distinctions, and we'll talk about those in a moment, that help shape our interpretations. So a distinction, I'll give an example. Think about the idea of just looking at the night sky and seeing lots of stars up there. And it's, it's pretty neat, right? It's, it's pretty amazing, especially if you're out in the country late at night, no backlights, it's great. Now, if someone who happens to be an amateur astronomer comes alongside you and starts to point out the different constellations and help you distinguish from stars and planets and starts to show you other features of the night sky, you suddenly are seeing the same thing, but you're not seeing the same thing. You have the ability to discern things that have been there, but that you weren't able to see. And so the idea about distinctions in language is that they give us tools and they allow us to observe how language is used in ways we might not otherwise. Now, just as listening with our ears and hearing are not the same, uh, we see with our eyes, but we observe through the lens of distinctions. So, some distinctions. Assertions and assessments. Now, we could say uh, facts and opinions, and you wouldn't be wrong. But when we use words like assertions and assessments, that kind of catches your attention because they're not familiar to us. And it's another way of calling attention to how we're using language. So there are two columns on the screen. You know, you can see the distinction and assertion is something that's factual. And it's an example of language as descriptive. An assertion really, um, and it belongs to the object being observed, okay? It's true, or it's false. An assessment, on the other hand, is more of a subjective statement and the speaker's defining how he or she relates to the world or to a specific event or characteristic. And the important thing about an assessment versus an assertion is that it belongs to the person making the assessment. It's really about the person making the assessment. And in many ways, it reveals much more about the observer who's making that assessment than the thing that they're observing. So we're gonna pause the video in a moment. And instead of just sort of talking about these things in an abstract sense, we're gonna do a coaching session. And then we're gonna turn the recording back on and talk a little bit. And we're gonna show how assertions and assessments play out, uh, not only in a coaching context, but really more uh, in a practical sense uh, of day-to-day -day, uh, living as a leader. Uh, as someone in relationship and in community. Uh, in a moment, I'll ask Holly to pause the recording. When we pause the recording, uh, I'm gonna ask that everyone turn off their camera um, to allow us to, to focus a little bit better. So um, before we move forward, 
I would like to know uh, if there's some brave soul out there who would like to be a volunteer. Okay, I see Anne. Okay, Anne is brave. So um, we're gonna pause the recording. Ready? So the conversation that, that Anne and I just had, what you probably noticed um, is that the word assessment came up quite a bit. And we touched on really how things were perceived, right? So that, so I, I tend to describe coaching uh, as a dance. It's a dance between objective reality and our experience of reality, because those two things are not always the same. And so that's why um, it's so important to kind of understand the difference between assertions and assessments and really learn to listen for that, not just in the internal self-talk, but maybe even within the family structure, uh, within the parish, within the office, you know, when someone perhaps is confusing what is objective reality with what is a subjective judgment. Um, some of you may be familiar with the ladder of inference, um, but the, the big jump up the ladder is we take observable data, right? And maybe, for example, uh, you know, that observable data might be, okay, I didn't do the three things that I set out to do today. And we then adopt beliefs based on that observable data. So maybe I go from, hmm, I didn't finish my to-do list. I see a bunch of things not checked off. And now I've gone up the ladder of inference. And based on that, I'm going to take a belief that maybe I am not a successful person. Maybe I'm not effective. Maybe I'm a poor employee. And so this is why it's important to pause and realize that um, how we interpret the subjective um, facts in our life um, really does matter. So, you know, another example, we, we heard an example in our session, but, you know, uh, an example maybe in parish life, assertion. You have a key member of the, the parish council or a key parishioner, you know, who has missed uh, some event, you know, for two or three times. Now, that's something that's factual. It's uh, empirically verifiable. There's no emotional content to that. But we might make an assessment about that, right? And when we make an assessment, we're now making an indication of intent and an indication of uh, future behavior, and that might influence the decision. So perhaps I see the observable. Okay, this person has missed a few events, and now I make an assessment. Oh, this person is no longer loyal to the parish, or this person is no longer a good parishioner. Um, you know, it, it's an example, you know, that can play out in other dimensions of life. So one of the things we have to be very clear on is, okay, I'm I have some facts here. I'm making a judgment about them. Maybe I should have a conversation that's missing. Maybe I should go and inquire. Hey, I noticed you haven't been here. You know, what's going on? And so part of the coaching process is helping the coaching client identify assessments, things that they're judgments they're making in their own minds based on observable factual reality. Uh, and then helping them work through that validating whether or not that judgment is in fact reflective of reality and then making some kind of a determination about what an alternative uh, assessment or an alternative judgment might be. Now, oftentimes our judgments lead to certain behaviors. And so part of changing our judgments is actually changing the behavior. Now, intu intuitively we, we might think, oh, if, if I change my judgment, I'll change my behavior. But sometimes if we change the behavior first, the judgment will follow. So in the example um, that we had a little bit ago, you know, near the end of the conversation, we talked about a new kind of behavior. And then we explored a little bit about how that behavior uh, would lend itself to a different mindset or to making different judgments um, throughout the day. And we'll have a, a chance to kind of talk about that a little bit more in the Q&A session if that's not really clear to everyone. So, you know, the, the one thing I'll say, you know, is um, to take away from this section, beware of, of missing conversations, conversations that should be had either with others 
or even with your own internal dialogue, you know, sort of probing what you're thinking about and why. Um, and this brings us to this, to the idea of, of grounding our assessments. So, and you hear this in coaching conversations, you may have heard this uh, in our, our demo as well. You know, it's important when you have a judgment or an assessment to clarify the why, you know, why am I thinking in this particular thought pattern? And then clarifying the standards. Okay, what causes me to make this particular judgment of something being good or bad or effective or not effective? And then it can be helpful to try to identify actions or events, right? Assertions that either support the assessment or that show the assessment um, not, in fact, to be accurate. And then finally, grounding that assessment with other people. Again, this is where the coaching process comes in. You know, you can sit down with a coach or even with a friend and have an informal conversation about, hey, I have this particular thought pattern about myself or about this event or situation. Uh, can I talk it out with you? One of the other things about assessments and one of the reasons why they're, they're important to be aware of is they sometimes can be related to our identities. You know, we can assess that a particular person is funny or a particular person is smart and we begin to identify them with that assessment. So, and it causes us sort of to lose the truth of the person uh, with whom we are in relationship when that uh, characterization or that assessment becomes the truth of the person. So we're gonna do just a, a really easy, I hope, group exercise. Um, but for that, I'd like to um, go ahead and pause the recording one final time. So moving beyond assessments, what do we do? So we've talked about them tonight. We've learned about this distinction. We can listen to conversations a little bit differently, either our own self-talk or conversations with others. Uh, one, notice when you're making an assessment, a judgment about something else. Just simply becoming aware can be a moment of transformation because if we're not aware of that pattern of thought, of that judgment, we can't do anything about it. And one of the um, beauties of coaching, one of the impacts of coaching is creating awareness. If you notice, don't make another assessment about yourself for making an assessment. So don't judge yourself, just simply be aware. Um, as we talked about, um, someone in their calm space or being calm and rational sitting at their desk versus in the midst of a lot of frantic activity. Um, when we're frantic, we are not at our best to kind of think through things. So if you realize you're making an assessment or a judgment, pause, pray, go for a walk, take a few deep breaths, and then turn your way, your mind away or your attention away from that assessment. And then reevaluate it you know, from a different perspective. In a moment, we'll go to takeaways and, and questions and answers, but um, just sort of optional homework, you know, I'll throw out there, you know, for, for those who are interested, you know, something to think about maybe for the remainder of the week or it's the end of the week, sorry, something to think about over the coming days. Maybe ask yourself, you know, what assessments am I making about myself? Or what are my assessments? Uh, because if we can identify those assessments, we may see that those assessments are limiting um, some of our possibilities. And then along the same lines, you know, are, are there missing conversations uh, at home, at work, in the parish or elsewhere that could help ground those assessments? So I think that is it for my formal content. I am now ready to take uh, any uh, questions or hear about your takeaways. And, and actually maybe, I think we have a little bit of time. Um, maybe if we could go around the, 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 uh, the Zoom and just if everyone could share a takeaway um, that they have from the conversation today, I think that would be um, helpful. And then we can dive into any questions if there are any. Um, I thought your, uh, your, your question, what would total control look like was a, uh, a good, a good point, a good starting point to, to get, to get her focused. I appreciated the 
uh, recap that you did to clarify, make sure that you uh, check in with your own understanding of what she what was being said to you, um, and that then was a nice summary and a very natural segue to next steps. Um, I really liked thinking about the way you presented assertions and assessments and also kind of tying it into Father Paul Lundberg's um, last session on perspective. Um, you know, when, when we notice the assessments or the story I'm telling myself and then taking the different perspectives, and this was one of the points on your slide about, you know, noticing the opposites, like, I'm a failure, my to-do list is a failure, my to-do list defines my success and failure, my to-do list does not define my success and failure, you know, like looking at those different perspectives and really kind of chewing on them and letting them sit there to, to really feel like, is that really true, you know? To Holly's comment, making it completely um, the Anne's answer, right? That it, it was nothing that you gave. It was something that she came to from the conversation. Father Elias, I just, I just love your coaching presence. I think you have a, just a, just a wonderful personality for this work. Um, you're very attentive, um, very considerate, very, you know, very just, I don't know, I think easy to relate to. And so I think that you're able to build rapport with people very, very easily. So that's that stood out to me. Father Paul, thank you. Glory to God. I appreciate uh, Anne not uh, holding back. You could tell that she was sticking with it. She she took full advantage of this this coaching session, which was awesome. I think uh, sometimes it's easy when you're being coached, especially in a group setting, just kind of ease off the gas a little bit. And it seemed like she kept it, kept it down there, which, which I can fully appreciate. Um, and then the coaching to be able to, to handle that. I think it was, it was, it was done very well, reflective, um, you know, not swaying on one side or the other and letting Anne kind of come to her own conclusions and, and figuring things out is a, is always great to see. Thank you for that. I thought it was uh, very useful that you, you brought out the necessity of conversations that hadn't happened. Um, you know, that it's too often in, in my own life, I'll, I'll make an assumption and run with it. And then, you know, by the methodology that you use, it points out the fact that, okay, are, are your assumptions still valid? Is, is this something that you've, uh, assumed on the situation or you clarified it or so I, I thought that was particularly useful. If, if there are no other uh, takeaways, we can go into questions, and I can give the talking stick back to Holly, if not. I sort of uh, came away that I think a lot to myself, talk to myself, and I keep getting the same answer. This gives me a chance to talk out loud and maybe come up with a different answer. Is the intent of a coaching session to bring the person to some conclusion to some a takeaway as opposed to just having a a loud conversation i i would say yes and no i think the primary intent of a coaching conversation is to create greater awareness in the person being coached i would say that the conversation lends itself to maybe asking the question, now that you're aware of something that was not obvious to you before, what would you like to do about it? Because normally, um, unless you're doing spot coaching or maybe you're doing you know, peer coaching, exchanging coaching with another coach, oftentimes someone will come to you and say, look, I'd like to work on this particular set of challenges or on this, this thing. And so the way that I think I, I structure and I think other coaches likely structure their engagements is okay, over the course of our time together, here are the things that you'd like to work on. And so really it's, you can think of it almost as uh, stepping stones to a new set of um, perhaps behaviors or even competencies um, from session to session. So the conversation that generates awareness 
almost naturally flows into the idea of, oh, now that I'm aware of this new thing, I can try something different um, that I, I couldn't do before because I simply wasn't aware of the thing I've learned in the coaching session. Is, is that a helpful answer? Yeah. Does the, does the client share in advance a problem or topic that they want to talk about? It, they can, they don't have to. Um, so if I'm coaching someone, you know, for the very first time, they said, hey, I'd like to, to coach with you. I'll often ask in advance, sure, you know, and I'll send them a, maybe a very brief questionnaire just to get a sense of, of what they'd like to talk about. But really, each and every session is almost like the first session, because it really should begin with um, getting very clear with the coaching client. What would you like to work on today? So you, you heard that in the demo, you know, I elicited, okay, what is it you'd like to, to coach about? Um, and then I reaffirmed to make sure I understood that what, you know, what I had heard. And then throughout the coaching session, you're kind of checking back in with that stated goal. And near the end, you know, kind of as a, as a bow tie almost, you really kind of tie back into, look, this is what we said we wanted to coach about today. You know, has the conversation we've been having, has it helped in this particular way? Supposing the person said, no, I'm not there yet. Does it carry over to the next session? It's up to them. This is one of the unique things about coaching. Um, the client drives the conversation. And so typically when I onboard a new client, I'm very clear, you know, if we come into an area where they don't feel comfortable, um, then they can declare, um, this is not an area where I'd like to coach. And the coach respects that. So you really have to go at the client's pace. I have a question, even as a coach or, you know, for people who aren't coaches, you know, we're just trying to actively listen. Certainly as you're taking them through self-awareness of their own assertions and assessments, as a listener, what kind of process are you thinking about in terms of recognizing your own assertions and assessments as you're reflecting back? Yeah, I think I understand your question. Um, as a coach, or even as someone who's just accompanying accompanying another human being in a conversation, um, I think it's important to stay in a place of non-judgment, meaning what you're listening to, you have to almost think of it as data. This person is sharing data with me. They're sharing information with me. And if you look at it that way, because uh, I like to say that we leak. So if I have a value judgment about something someone is saying to me, um, that value judgment is going to leak and it's going to come across and suddenly it's no longer a safe conversation. So, so part of having a coaching conversation, whether you're a coach or a parent or an employer or a, a coworker or a pastor you know, or just a, a fellow human being is creating um, this place of intimacy and trust. And part of intimacy and trust is, okay, I am being seen as a person. I'm not being seen as a pathology or, you know, as someone who's crazy. You know, if you remember during the demo, uh, you know, and said, well, uh, that sounds crazy. And I was very clear to say, no, I don't think that at all. You know, I'm just repeating back what I'm hearing. So I think it's important for us as well like when we are being coached and we hear what, what, what just came out of our mouth to, to accept it with wonder, not with judgment. The reason I got into coaching was I was being coached by an executive coach when I was in the federal sector. She was very kind for the first few sessions. And I think about midway through the engagement, she took out a two by four and it was just one simple question. I don't even remember the question, but it rocked my world. And so I, I, I didn't uh, deflect or anything. I just sort of, I sat with that, but it reverberated. Uh, and it, it, it quite literally changed the trajectory of my career and my life. But I was able to just sit with that, not make it, just accept it and uh, to be with it, so. And I'm gonna presume that had she asked you a question like that in the first session, you probably would have demurred and said, I don't wanna be coached there. Yeah, I wouldn't have been ready for it. It would have been incomprehensible. But, but the relationship was clear to you. And so this was like, oh, this is going to help. Yes, we had built up. That's that's an excellent question, Father. We had built up trust over time. 
we built up trust over time and she had helped me to grow in self-knowledge as well. Well, Holly, I think the talking stick is yours. Father Elias, thank you so much. What a remarkable session. Thank you for your presentation. And, and um, I, in the interest of being on the recording, I'm, I'm really grateful to the person who uh, stepped up to be coached in the session and was brave and courageous. And, and as a participant said, um, you know, kept the gas on and, and hung in there, um, really wanting to grapple with the issue. So thank you so much for that. Um, you know, if you or anybody in your circle of friends, family, uh, might have an assessment that they might be considering or curious about or maybe wanting some coaching around, I would really encourage you to take a look at orthodoxservantleaders.com and click on the leadership coaching um, resource. I'll just go ahead and share my screen. Can you all see that? All right, so, so it's really under like the resources and, or sorry, programs and leadership coaching here. And um, so, you know, just trying to meet people where they're at and it's really to try to help people discover and clarify what they want to achieve. As Father Elias said, to really help build self-awareness, you know, uncover some strategies, some next steps for the challenges that you're facing and really foster some kind of accountability and responsibility and self-leadership for, for what it is that you're facing. So you can come to the site, you can ask for a free session. Uh, we have a built, we have a growing network of coaches right now. These are the ones, um, I think we have five right now who are, who are, who are willing and ready to take clients. Um, they are orthodox, they are coaching professionals. So we encourage you to take a look at each of their bios and where they're coming from. Um, and then also we do have some resources here. So keep a lookout on a quarterly basis, even under events, we'll have um, some quarterly coaching and leadership sessions. These are meant to introduce people to the concept of coaching, this sort of thing. And then we also have um, some other previous recordings and a few podcasts here on, on coaching as well. We are trying to spin up to Dan's question. Um, spin up a, a podcast where we have like a coaching, a short coaching conversation, much like what you wit witnessed tonight, just to kind of build awareness or, around what this practice really is. And then I would also encourage you, if you're interested, if you're a coach or you're thinking about becoming a coach, consider joining the coaching network. Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunities for connecting with people on a monthly basis, people who are like-minded, sharing the same Orthodox faith, and really wanting to be living with integrity in their coaching practice as an Orthodox, as an Orthodox Christian. Um, and then there's other opportunities, continuing education credits, this sort of thing, um, you know, some coach mentoring opportunities, some client referral opportunities within the network as well. Um, we do have a partnership also with the Professional Christian Coaching Institute. So they give um, our members a discount on their introductory course. Um, and we've got some other things that we're working on with them. So that's been exciting. And then just the purpose of the network that I described a little bit at the beginning, um, just providing some opportunities to for professionals to offer their coaching services to clergy and other members within the church to just provide an enriching exchange. It's a blessing to be able to listen and to share and to have this kind of conversation. Um, so check us out, take a look. Um, there's These are the monthly meeting topics. Some of our members are already listed here. So this is all on orthodoxservantleaders.com. And again, I'd like to thank uh, Father Elias for his incredible presentation tonight. I really appreciate the mindfulness, the attentiveness. Thank you so much, Father Elias, for, for that. It was just really remarkable to just see someone in action with such attentive listening. And thank you also for this, the presentation, giving us a lot of food for thought as we um, try to serve and lead in our unique responsibilities and hopefully 
thinking about reaching out, having some of those conversations with people that we love to help check us on the assessments that we're telling about ourselves. So glory to God. Thank you for that. And thank you all, all of one you quick, for joining tonight. I have one quick question. Is, is the coaching always one-on-one? -on -one? That's a great question, Dan. So, <clears throat> so um, in the, in the free session on the page I was just showing you, that is one-on-one -on -one individual coaching. But I will also say that we, the Orthodox Christian Leadership Initiative hires professional certified coaches to do our peer learning facilitation. So that's in small groups, people like clergy groups or church treasurers or parish council presidents. There are small groups of peer learning and the coaches facilitate those conversations. And then we also use professional coaches to do the parish council um, work, like the workshops and parish health coaching along the way. So it's not just delivering content in a workshop, but it's really providing a, a place to ask the provocative questions so that the team, the parish council, can really engage the work together. And with those provocative questions, have the important conversations that they need to have to identify their next steps forward. And that um, that professional coach can help provide some accountability in that space as well. So they've been really great to work with. Um, the Orthodox Christian Leadership Initiative really is taking a coach approach to everything that we're doing. So thank you for that question, Dan. That wasn't planned. <laughs> that was a good one. I know we're at time, Holly, but can we close with a prayer? Thank you, Father. Yes. Um, so going back to the verse I shared at the beginning, I'm going to share it again now and just put it out there for you to reflect on based on what you've heard and learned tonight. From St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 6, verses 2 and 3. Carry one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we give thanks to you, O Lord, that you have satisfied us through this gathering, instructed us in uh, some things that uh, we may learn from and grow from in the practice of coaching. And as you came to your disciples and granted them your peace, which surpasses all understanding, so also come to us and save us, O Savior. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us.